Caliuchus is not just a story of duality, but a story of fusion. Lots of artists pay homage to different parts of themselves, but very few do so in a cohesive way that serves the same core audience. That's the mark of a creative genius, and that's the mark of Caliuchus. Born Carly Marina Loisa in Virginia in 1994, Caliuchus was a nickname given to her by her father, whom she didn't really have the best relationship with, but we'll get to that later. After she was born, her family relocated to her home city in Colombia called Pereira. Cannot roll my R's, I'm sorry where they were meant to stay permanently. Things didn't really work out, and after a few years of Cali in Colombian schools, they decided to move back to Virginia. Her father managed a bunch of apartments there and put Cali to work at a young age. Putting up drywall, caulking stuff, she was basically doing freelance construction as a teenager. In the meantime, her house was always full. Her father was helping family members coming from Colombia to get on their feet in America with a job and a place to stay. She found herself gravitating toward art as the one thing that would give her solitude in such a hectic living environment. Painting, drawing, writing, filming, singing, dancing, you name it, Callie tried it in her room. She went to T.C. Williams High School in Virginia, and luckily they had a great art department to foster all her interests. She played piano and saxophone and even became the first chair in her school's jazz band. Oddly enough, Callie actually settled on wanting to direct films after high school. She found herself skipping class unless it was in the context of using the school's facilities to help with her art, like a dark room or a computer lab, stuff like that. She eventually started breaking curfew at home as well, all in an effort to work on these films. Eventually, she ran into two issues. One, her father was obviously unhappy about the whole skipping class and breaking curfew thing, so he kicked her out of the house. Callie lived out of her Subaru Forester for a couple months, crashing on her friend's couches in between, and she ended up working at Whole Foods, scraping by as best she could and learning a lot about herself. After reconciling with her father and moving back into her room, she faced the second problem, which was that she had no music for these short films she was trying to make. Something compelled her to make 17 songs in one night just to solve this. She packaged the songs into a mixtape called Drunken Babble and uploaded it to a site that was popular at the time called Dat Pit. And while yes, Callie got that original movie soundtrack that she wanted, she also got way more attention for the mixtape itself. A lot of it is just sample loops with Callie's vocals on top, but you get a sense of the dreaminess and old school aesthetic that she liked to implement across all her art. And more importantly, her versatility in flow and delivery across genres. She was combining elements of old R&B, jazz, doo-wop, all creating this kind of modern lounge singer vibe. Drunken Babble made its way from Dat Piff to some pretty important people, including Tyler the Creator and Snoop. A year after the mixtape came out and it got shared around a bunch, Callie released a music video for one of the songs called What They Say, and that's how Snoop found her and publicly co-signed her. It led to a collab in 2014 on Snoop's compilation album That's My Work 3, titled On Edge, and with Tyler it led to a few features on Callie's 2015 EP, Port Vida. Yes, the success of Drunken Babble led Callie to make a follow-up EP with contributions not just from Tyler, but from K Tronada and Bad Bad Not Good. Luckily, right before this, Callie had saved up 11K from her job at Whole Foods to move to LA and take advantage of any further opportunities that would come her way. And come her way, they did. She ended up featuring on a Daniel Caesar track in 2016 called Get You, and the following year got on a track with Juanes. Now, it would be nothing short of an understatement to say that Juanes is a huge deal in Colombia, but probably more important to note here is that this was the moment that Callie finally got her parents' approval for making music. Once they heard Juanes and the Latin Grammy nomination, they started to take her seriously. In 2017, she linked back up with Tyler to feature on his track, See You Again, off 2017's Flower Boy, which far and away ended up being the most streamed song on that album, and it also might have always been my favorite. And in 2018, hot off of opening for Lana Del Rey on tour, we got her debut album, Isolation, absolutely stacked with features. From Steve Lacey to Bia to Georgia Smith to Raycon and you guessed it, Tyler. After the Storm was a huge hit and to this day remains a timeless song, thanks in part to some great live playing from Canadian jazz outfit Bad Bad Don Good, as well as some backup from Bootsy Collins. Flight 22 is also one of my favorite tracks on that album that nobody seems to talk about, and it was made in collaboration with Dap Kings, who were the band on Amy Winehouse's album Back to Black. Kind of makes sense given what this track sounds like. Isolation was one of my personal favorite albums for that year for not just being so versatile, but remaining so cohesive. The through line is 
is always Callie's dreamy cabaret style vocals with production changing styles underneath from bossa nova to reggaeton to just straight pop. If anything, isolation proved even further that Callie was a force to be reckoned with, a mind and a collaborator that you did not want to pass up on. Kay Trinata was one of the few people that knew this at the time and snatched her up for a collab. She featured on Kay's track 10% off his 2019 album Bubba, which led to a Grammy win for best dance recording. It seemed like everything Callie touched turned to gold at this point. However, I'll say that it's usually at this point in an artist's career where they kind of get in their head a little too much and they either overthink their next move or don't really think it through at all. And luckily Callie did neither. Everyone told her for her sophomore LP that she should just basically make Isolation 2. Being a friend and collaborator of Tyler, she had kind of already made fans out of that odd future alt R&B alt rap crowd, which was a valuable and loyal fan base to have. And from the outside, I can't really say that I would have told her to do much different. It's definitely the safe play. But in this pivotal moment, she stuck to her guns and tried something new and it really worked out. She released a record that was basically entirely in Spanish in 2020. This angered a bunch of fans very childishly, might I add, but it also broke Callie into a whole new market space. Remember when we were talking earlier about Callie's ability to pull something cohesive together while production style and genre hopping? Well, it turns out she can do the same thing while language hopping. What's incredible about Simievo to me is that it contains so much of the Caliuch's brand while being in a completely different language. And I'm not even a native Spanish speaker. Like I took it in high school. I know it a little bit. I'm just giving you my context here. The dreamy vocal delivery and production is there. The pop catchiness is there. That alt R&B odd future sound selection is there. The melodic old school influence is there. And the versatility in genre and style is there. When you have someone who's going after that lounge singer vibe, it can be very easy to end up exploring a lot of similar ideas because the main draw of the music is that your voice is just really pretty, right? And if we're being honest, that's kind of how I feel about Georgia Smith. I love diving into her stuff for small amounts of time, but listening to a whole Georgia Smith record can feel a little samey. Even though Callie is going for that similar lounge singer aesthetic, she challenges herself in a way that Georgia hasn't yet. Georgia, if this somehow ends up in front of your face, I love you. I think you could do amazing things. <laughs> that all being said, I think we know the rest of Callie's story from here. Telepatia blows up as her most played song in large part thanks to TikTok and Callie is launched into the mainstream with a song in Spanish. Who knew that was going to be the outcome? Now Callie's got two more records on the way, one in English, one in Spanish, and she's tweeted asking her fans which one they want first. And I think the remarkable thing is they don't care. They love her creative approach no matter what language it's in. Beyond the story, I think what's always been interesting about Callie is fusion. Whether it's been fusion of language, fusion of vocal style, fusion of collaborators, fusion of genre. Callie's one of those people who likes to collage whatever's on the inside walls of her brain and present it in a way that works, in a way that's authentic. And that's someone who's hyper creative. That's a genius. It's not often that an artist basically pivoting into a different market is what puts them in the mainstream. Callie took her fusion based mentality to that market and surprise, it worked. If the creativity's there, it's there, no matter what the language. When Callie said, why would I be Kim? I could be Kanye. It seems like she really meant it. If you enjoyed hearing about Callie, check out this profile I did on Katrinata here. The dude doesn't talk much, but turns out his story is just as intriguing and inspiring as Callie's.